Inside the Mind, the official podcast of Missouri S&T Athletics. Patrick Murphy here with you again, as always, as we'll be recapping the winter sports season on this episode today. As uh, the final weekend of the indoor championships wrapped up uh, this past weekend. Uh, but before we get into that, I would like to thank Missouri S&T Corporate Club member Missouri S&T Dining Services for their sponsorship of this episode. I also want to thank them for their membership in the Corporate Club and their support of Minor Athletics. And before we get going, too, if you haven't already, uh, please be a friend, tell a friend about this show as we continue to uh, produce episodes, have great conversations on this show. Uh, our first 12 episodes have been just absolutely phenomenal. If you haven't uh, had a chance to listen to any of those, you can go back and uh, and find those on minorathletics.com. There's links to all uh, all audio and uh, video platforms on there, as well as links to every episode as well. Uh, if you have been uh, been watching the show, uh, thank you for your support. We're up to almost 900 total plays uh, by the time this episode will come out. So. For, uh, for those of you who have been watching, we thank you for your support, and uh, you're the reason we're able to keep doing this show uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, as I said, we uh, are going to be talking about the winter sports season on this episode, but before we get into that, we're going to uh, recap the week that was in uh, Missouri S&T Athletics. I want to start by uh, talking about men's golf last week, I believe, on the uh, athletic training episode we had last week. Uh, in the recap, I think we may have forgotten to mention that the golf team was uh, back in action at the Las Vegas Desert Classic and want to highlight their top 15 finish in an event that was loaded with uh, top 50 teams. Uh, Miners finished 13th, I believe, in a 19-team field. Uh, Carl Milton was the low man for s and in that event with a 54-hole score of 220, while Colin Stolze, who was a guest on this show uh, a couple weeks back before the golf team headed out to Las Vegas, posted a 54-hole score of 225. Men's golf team will be back in action next Monday and Tuesday uh, in St. Charles at the Lindenwood Invitational. Baseball was back in action. They opened a four-game split-site weekend series with Southwest Baptist on the road Thursday afternoon in Bolivar. Uh, won both games of that doubleheader, a couple of seven-inning contests by scores of 6-1 to one and 12-8. to eight. Game one saw Cade Meyer go the distance in his first outing of the season as he worked seven strong innings, allowed one run on two hits, struck out six, uh, retired the first nine he faced in that game, and uh, I believe 10 of the last 12 or 10 of the last 11 batters he faced to finish out the afternoon after he kind of ran in, ran into a little bit of a hiccup towards the middle of the game. Game two, the Miners came from behind, kind of got down 4 nothing early to the Bearcats, but a uh, big night from Brady Voss in game two kind of helped swing the momentum as uh, S&T had a six-run inning that kind of changed the, out, changed the course of that game. Voss went three for four in that game with a two-run double, four RBIs, uh, that two-run double came on a 11-pitch at bat, after which he he started down 0-2, fouled off several pitches in a row, worked the count, and uh, ended up doubling down the left field line to plate two with bases loaded. And then uh, after that six-run inning, made a diving catch in the outfield to end the next half inning. Uh, so uh, definitely, uh, SBU is not not too big of a Brady Voss fan Thursday night. Um, that series wrapped up Sunday in Rolla, where the weather was uh, much warmer and the bats were uh, just as hot, if not hotter, than Thursday. As so S&T powered their way to a series sweep by scores of 11-5 and 14-4. Both of those games Sunday were also seven-inning contests. Big innings were the order of the day for S&T. Miners had, uh, I believe, four innings over the course of play Sunday, where they scored five or more runs. Several players uh, doing some yard work, Doug Wood, Brady Voss, um, went went deep, um, lots of offense and uh, some pretty good pitching as well from the Miners. Uh, Dylan Mollett got the win in Game One. Matt Ellingson picked up the the win in relief in Game Two. So uh, coming into this week, Miners will be back at home uh, this weekend against uh, Missouri St. Louis in a four game series, meeting Friday at the ballpark at S&T. Nine inning contest on Friday at 2 p.m. followed by. A uh, couple of seven-inning games starting Saturday at 12 p.m. Uh, before the series finale Sunday, uh, which will be a single nine-inning contest, uh, also with a 12 p.m. start time. Softball had their home opener Sunday uh, against Truman State to begin GOVC play. Came away with a split against the Bulldogs, winning 7-5 in Game 1 before uh, getting run-ruled in six innings in Game 2. Again, big inning 
Uh, big innings for ST was a difference in game one. A five-run second was the decider in that game. Ashley Davis went two for two with a pair of uh, runs batted in, while Shannon Flowers went two for four with an RBI, and Bryn Wooldridge picked up the win in the circle. Monday, softball's back on the road for another GLVC series against William Jewell. That series was originally scheduled for Friday, but due to uh, frigid temperatures and uh, some inclement weather, the hopefully the last blast of winter weather that we'll have to deal with this year, the uh, that those games were pushed to Monday. Uh, those games are played at the Urban Youth Academy in Kansas City as William Jewell is in the midst of resurfacing their uh, baseball and softball fields uh, with an artificial surface. Uh, obviously, they're lo- those aren't complete. I'm sure the winter weather's had something to do with that. Miners fell game one, fell uh, five to one in game one, um, before rallying late in game two uh, to pick up a split behind a grand slam from Hannah Ancelotis, who was on the show a couple weeks back when we were uh, previewing softball. Uh, so be, go sh- be be sure to go and check that episode out. <laughs> Uh, that was a 6-3 final in uh, Game 2 yesterday. Bryn Wildridge again got the win in the circle, while Ancelotta, Shannon Flowers, and Bailey Jobson all had multi-hit games for s and in that winning effort. It was championship uh, weekend at the NCAA Swimming and Diving Championships in North Carolina. The Miners opened the week with a 7th place finish in the 200-yard medley relay and uh, earned All-American honors in that event. Day 2 saw a trio of All-American outings from the swim team. Andy Huffman and Jay Mercer uh, earning All-American honors in the 400 IM, and also got a All-American outing out of the 400-yard medley relay team as they uh, placed 14th in that event. Day 3, that was on Friday last week, 800-yard freestyle relay team placed 10th to earn another All-American honor for uh, that team, while Andy Huffman notched another individual All-American uh, accolade as he finished 14th in the 200-yard butterfly. Saturday, Huffman garnered his third All-America honor of the meet, uh, closing out the weekend with a 10th place showing in the 200-yard breaststroke. Also this weekend, uh, the in- NCAA Indoor Track and Field Championships. Those were over in Pittsburgh, Kansas, uh, at that beautiful indoor facility on the campus of Pittsburgh State. Nathan Swadley, the lone representative from Missouri S&T, uh, garnered All-American honors and placed sixth in the shot put, breaking his own school record, which he had previously set at the uh, Great Lakes Valley Conference Championships a couple weeks back, with a mark of 59, one and a quarter in the fourth round of throws, became the first minor since 2016 to earn All-America honors in track and field, and is the first S&T competitor ever to earn All-America status in in, in an indoor throwing event. Uh, that's also the 21st Indoor All-America award in program history. Looking forward to this week. First off, we want to wish everyone a happy St. Pat's. This week, the 114th best ever St. Pat's to all who will be partaking in the festivities as we remind everyone to do so safely and responsibly this week. Said plenty of action to take in on campus this week. Um, you know, we mentioned baseball. They'll be back in action this weekend against Umsel at home in a four-game series. Softball will be back uh, starting Wednesday when this episode airs against Minnesota State Moorhead. 1 p.m. doubleheader uh, before they will... Uh, it'll be their turn to play Southwest Baptist this weekend, Saturday, before hosting Rockhurst on Sunday, another GOVC doubleheader. Uh, both of those will be 12 p.m. start times back up the hill at the Missouri S&T softball field. We'll step aside for a short break. When we come back, we'll dive into recapping the winter sports season on this episode of Inside the Mind, presented again by Missouri S&T Dining Services. <laughs> This episode of Inside the Mind will be recapping the winter sports season on this episode. Joining me to do so, the man in the big chair in our office, John Keane. John, uh, I guess you're this. Uh, I guess this means you're the uh, the first repeat guest, so to speak, we've had on the show since this is the uh, the second time you've been on. As we're getting ready to recap the winter season, so uh, you know we're finally out of crossover season. We can finally kind of take a step back and breathe. Uh, I know how I'm feeling. But how are you feeling? <laughs> well, you know, I think I'm kind of same boat you're in right now. Just a chance to kind of catch our breath a little bit finally, as you know, it's kind of a pretty hectic winter season. You know, with a lot of stuff going on, and, and the crossover season kind of gets into the mix, and then you know, for about a, a month, you're just dealing with you know, mo- you know, way more than you're used to, and at least now we have a chance to kind of you know. I would say relax, but a chance to kind of ease, you know, the schedule eased up a little bit for us now. We don't have, you know, basketball games and baseball games and 
things like that going on the same day. So at least now we can just kind of concentrate on the spring sports now from here on out. Sure. Yeah, no, we've, you know, it's only just baseball games and softball games on the same day, not baseball and softball and basketball and everything else. So that's always one of the uh, the fun times of the year is just working working through uh, the, the two crossover seasons, the, that transition from the fall to the winter and then again from the winter to the spring. So uh, we'll go ahead and jump right into it. Um, so I guess we'll, I guess the best way to do this is we'll kind of start in uh, the order in which the winter sports got going. So I guess that means swimming is going to be first up on the docket. Um, another strong season out of uh, the S&T swim program uh, wrapped up over this past weekend at uh, the indoor championships. It was what, in Green, Greensboro? Yes. Yeah, Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, with seven individuals competing at the uh, NCAA championships. Season uh, started a little bit later uh, than originally scheduled, had some health and safety protocol issues, uh, but once S&T did get going, uh, off to a really strong start, picked up a couple of dual wins over Delta State that uh, first weekend of the season, uh, went up to Mizzou at the Missouri Invitational, competing against several Division One teams, uh, picked up a top five finish uh, in that meet, uh, posted win over Missouri St. Louis to close out the semester before uh, before the holidays, came back from the holidays, picked up a win over Truman State, uh, posted a fourth place showing at the GLVC Championships as a team, and uh, saw plenty of strong individual performances uh, that really stood out over the course of the season, and obviously uh, a plethora of uh, academic or All-American honors uh, at the uh, NCAA championships over the weekend. So, John, I'll, I'll uh, go ahead and let you kind of talk about it a little bit more. Uh, what were what were kind of some of the things that really stood out to you and some of the highlights from uh, the time in the pool for the minors this season? Well, I think first of all, <clears throat> excuse me, I think first of all, you really had a season that's kind of typical of what we've seen out of the minors here in recent years. Uh, we're competing in arguably the toughest swimming conference in the country. If you really look at it, we finished fourth in the conference meet, and the three teams ahead of us were Drury, Indianapolis and McKendry. Those teams finished two, three, four at nationals this past weekend. That's stiff competition that you're, that, you know, we competed against, you know, during the regular season. You know, and those teams have divers, which certainly plays into the team scores as well. So I mean, we don't have a diver on our roster, so you know, we certainly, you know, we get hurt from that standpoint that we can't gain points in that, you know, in that event, or really two events. You have a one meter and a three meter diving competition, but our swimmers themselves, you know, competed very, very well during the season and. Obviously, you know, you always want to culminate your year swinging at your best. And a lot of our season high marks for our season best performances came at the conference meet. Yeah, and sure. then some, yeah. and some of them also, you know, better those at the national meet this past weekend. So, and we had one school record set this past weekend. So, you know, certainly I think the year certainly went, you know, quite well. It was certainly, you know, a year where there's a little bit of transition, as always is the case. But, you know, some of our guys, you know, especially our younger guys, really I thought got better this year. I think certainly Hunter Wiedemeyer got better. I think, you know, Aiden Walters got better. I think, you know, one guy, Nolan Fergus, really became a, you know, a top scorer for this team during the course of the season. You know, Martin Melinder in the, you know, distance events, you know, certainly did. And that goes along with your old, older, you know, competitors as well, like Andy Huffman and, you know, Josh Umrich, the, you know, the older guys on the roster that, you know, did their thing, you know, both at the conference and national levels. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it uh, again that fourth place showing at the at the GOVC championships, um, and then you know again a solid showing at uh, the the NCAA championships over the weekend uh, as a team finishing nineteenth uh, out of out of thirty teams that were represented there. Um, had several you know All American finishes there. Uh, All America is what top sixteen. Top sixteen. Top sixteen. Um, you know, just kind of talk about what. What we saw this past weekend uh, at the NCAA's, uh, you know, as a four-day meet started Thursday, and uh, you know, it's pretty much just uh, an All-American honor just about every day. Of that yeah, event. the only day was the first day we didn't get one, but after that, you know, we did very, very well during the course of the, the four days of the meet. And you really started on Thursday. You know, we had three All-American showings that first day, and that we actually won some. We had actually won the first night with a relay, but um, then we had three All-American showings on day two. And, you know, Andy Huffman got three of them during the meet. He got one each of the last three days. Um, you know, culminated his career with 13 All-America honors. You know, you know, terrific. You know, and, of course, last year he was the Elite 90 winner. You know, so. Where, do, where does that 13 stack up with Andy all-time in the program? It's high on the list, but we've got people with over 20 in their careers. We had some guys who, you know, like David Belleville and, you know, Jack Panuto and, you know, no individual like that. Andrew Schrank had a lot of All-America performances during their careers. So, 
you know, but 13 is nothing to be, you know, ashamed that's, of at all. That's still a very, very decorated career uh, for Andy, uh, who actually came on the show uh, several weeks ago if, mm-hmm. uh, when, we were, when we had uh, him and, and uh, Coach Doug Rooms on. So if you haven't haven't heard that episode, be sure to go back and, and check that one out. But, uh, you know, the, the you know the relay teams both brought home All-American honors um, and, and a couple a couple other individuals as well. So that's, uh, again, another a really, really strong – typical Missouri S and T swimming season. You know, you're ranked through, ranked in the top twenty, mm-hmm. top twenty five just to, you know, from start to finish again. So a couple of good dueling victories this year. We had one over Delta State, which was ranked very high in the country at the time we competed against them. And you know, obviously your performances at Mizzou was very impressive there. I mean against some all division one competition outside of us. And we performed very, very well there and got a lot of our individuals that made it to nationals, you know, got their times at that meet and back in mid November. And you finished fifth in that event too, against again, like you said, a field that's you know, we were the only the only D two team there, uh, going up against, you know, the likes of, you know, obviously Mizzou and everybody else at that division one level, like right. Missouri State and everybody else. So, um but on an individual basis, you had Andy, of course, won the three all America honors, you know, won one each of the last three days. Jay Burser got his first one, uh first uh, All-America Award, he got that in the 400-yard individual medley, did that on Thursday. Then we get into Friday in the meet, and we got two more All-America efforts and an all-school and an all um, school record in the process, too. Um, we had a relay team that, you know, three of our four relay teams that competed at Nationals, you know, got in the top 16. Um, Noah Clancy set the school record, didn't even, you know, get in the top 16. I mean, he went um, 47-85, you know, in the preliminary round on Friday morning, and it was like a tenth of a second off making the top 16. I mean, that's how fast that field is. I mean, that's you know, meat. When you, but, when you get to that level, you're literally splitting hairs with like tenths of a second. Oh, yeah, it is. of a second. I mean, you just look at like the Saturday relay, the Florida, uh, freestyle relay. We were point one four off of making the finals. I mean, we're just, you know, making that top 16 there. I mean, it's that's, it's that that's close. Literally, that's a fingertip. Yeah, or less. Exactly. It's, it's very, very close, and that's you know. But you know, again, we competed really well over the course of the season and did well at the conference and national meets, and that's certainly what you know Doug Rubens is looking for. He wants his teams to compete well, and they, you know, really I think save their best for the end of the year, and that's exactly what they did. Absolutely. Yeah. No. It's uh, it's always good to you know to see swimming come out have have strong showings, um, and you know, kind of kind of get kind of get back into that normal routine. Of, of competing this year, uh, after, obviously given everything that's been going on the last couple of years, you know, finally have, being having having fans be able to come out to the couple home meets we had this year, I know that uh, kind of helps have an edge. You know, having fans in attendance in the postseason and um, and everything else. So uh, another strong showing for swimming this year, absolutely. Uh, we had great turnouts for our home meets this year too. The two that we had when students were around, you know, we had the one in November and then we had the one in January and. You know, we had great turnouts for those meets. You know, the third one was during a afternoon in December, right, as finals were finishing up. And, you know, I went, a, well, I went around and I found the Billy at that time. But, you know, still had even a decent turnout that day for an afternoon meet. I think it's it's really tricky because a lot of people always kind of forget, like, that we, one, have a pool, and, two, you know, if they do know, it's like, where is it? Because it's kind of tucked up around the back yeah. behind behind uh, Gibson Arena. It's on that same level of the building. Right. But you just got to keep going. And I don't think a lot of people – Kind of know it's know it's back there because it's just kind of tucked up. You say we need a sign up there to tell us where the pool is. I mean, it might be something we can look into over the summer. I don't like just you know it you know update all the signage in the building. You yeah. know, it's like rec courts, Gibson Arena, pool, offices. You know, it's not, I I I don't know. We'll we'll see about that. Um, we'll pivot. Go talk uh, men's basketball next. Another strong se- or strong season by the Miners under uh, third year head coach Bill Walker. Uh, eleven and seventeen record this season. If I'm looking at every, yep, eleven and eleven and seventeen record. Uh, seven and thirteen in the GLVC, and uh, if if I'm not mistaken, that's uh, the most wins in a season uh, since 2016-17 when yeah. uh, they went went twelve and fourteen. That's also the most uh, conference wins in a season. Um, I think that season S and T had six wins. So you go back to twenty um, thirteen fourteen. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, but, you know, also several marquee wins for uh, S&T. S&T over the course of uh, the season, uh, picking up a win against uh, Rockhurst, uh, you know, Quincy on the road, uh, and McKendry here uh, in overtime games, uh, knocked off Southwest Baptist, really good Southwest Baptist team uh, for closing out the regular season here at home with a win over Lewis. 
Um, had a trio of all-conference nominees this, or, or a trio of all-conference honorees, not nominees, honorees this season. Uh, Julian Smith was an all-GLVC uh, second team, or Caden Froby named to the all-GLVC uh, all de- defensive team. Well, Dylan Singleton was on the all-freshman team, second year in a row the Miners have had representation on that squad. Definitely a year of progression and, uh, and a lot of high-level performance from the men's team this year. A lot of, you know, had some new faces come in this year. Obviously, Alex Strotting was a big, big ad this year, really – Really helped contribute at a high level this year. Um, Dylan Singleton coming in is a, is a first year freshman right away, and then obviously you got uh, some returners like Ryan Parker, Micah Johnson, uh, Mohamedou Kaba Kamara, uh, Julian, and Caden, uh, who all came in and helped uh, help the Miners play at a really high level this season. Well, let's try to find a better way to start on all this. Number one, I think you talked about our season, and you know maybe the wins of most significance this year, and maybe. I would say first, the first sign that we certainly could play with a lot of teams was the game that we played in Springfield right before Thanksgiving, the day before Thanksgiving. Oh, yeah, Southeast that, Oklahoma that, State. That thir- yeah, that Thanksgiving tournament down at – And uh, we lose 104-102 to a team that arguably could have been in the NCAA tournament very easily. And the only reason they didn't make it was, you know, maybe the regionalization of NCAA championships. Which we, we, were, kept t- them out we, were, we were talking about that the other day. Yeah. And – that's a team that certainly could play in a regional somewhere and didn't get in because their conference got one bid. It was a team that didn't, you know, that, that won the conference tournament outside of the top eight in the region and knocked them out. That was a very, very good Southeast Oklahoma team that they you know, lost by 2-2 two, two back in uh, November. And, uh, had a one-point game against Arkansas Monticello that weekend, yeah. too. And that wasn't was, – how, how was Monticello They this year? fell off during the course okay. of the season. But That's... you go down the line and really – we got into January, and we had had a losing streak against Rockers that dated back to the 2016. We got a win up there by 20. You know, we got – then a week there, right around Martin Luther King Day. We had a week we went into Quincy. We had not beaten Quincy up in their arena in a JLVC game until that night. And we got – well, Micah hit a shot late in regulation, a three-pointer, yeah, put it, the game it, in overtime. It was almost a three. It, is I think – yeah, because I remember I went back and looked because I was watching because you, yeah. you traveled. I was here. I went back and looked at that one uh, on the on the stream because I had it pulled up on my TV. If he's like it was, you know, his you know, catch and shoot, you know, pull up jumper, and if he's about another like eight, not, not even eight inches, maybe like another four inches back, yeah. we're winning that in regulation. But the Miners did win the game in overtime, and you know, broke that long losing streak to them. And then they came out and they beat Southwest Baptist in the game they were behind by double figures in at one point, and had a terrific second half that night and knocked off SBU. And that was a team that beat the Miners by 19 back in December. And really, the Miners kind of dominated that game back in December. But they really came out and played exceptionally well in the second half. You know, Julian Smith did Julian Smith things in the yeah, second half of that game that night. 20, 25 in yeah. that game. And, and the thing with Julian is, like, yeah, he averaged like 20 points a game this year. But, like, half the time it was just like a super casual. It's like, oh, you look up, oh, he's got 23. You know, he's just doing, doing like I said, what Julian Smith does. He had monster second halves in a lot of those games, too. And then, you know, we you know, extended that winning streak to three, you know, we'd be rockers, you know, after the SBU win. Now, at that point in time, you're thinking, you know, if we have a good February, you know, we got a chance, you know, the way the GLBC was going at that point in time, you got a shot at maybe hosting a game in the first round of the conference tournament. Sure, You yeah. got a chance to get into the top eight. Unfortunately, we kind of fell off after that, you know, somewhat. We had a disappointing loss at Drury to a, you know, a Drury team that, you know, was – a little, little shorthanded that day. It, yeah. It, and it had COVID, had injuries. They were coming off of the you know, COVID break and all that, and we went down there. We became two deficits in that game, and you thought it, we were right on the cusp of getting this thing in our control, and then the third time Drury made a run on us, we couldn't make it up. Then we had a loss at Maryville by one. We were way behind. We made a big run to take the lead. Yeah, took the, took the lead with like nine seconds left. Gave up a basket, yep. and we had a shot to win the game. And yeah, it was half, you know, that was, halfway down and came back out because yeah, I was. I was Julian was, took it. Yep. And that was a game where, it, you know, Julian's season, you know, I'll come back to the rest of the season here in a minute, but that was kind of the point in the year where Julian kind of went to that little bit of a shooting funk too. Yeah. It was, um, he didn't have a very good day that day. He had a bad game against Maryville, a bad game against Olsen after that. He finally kind of got himself back on track before the season was over. I think the last three games, I think he started kind of finding his stroke again, and that's, you know – you know, it was kind of lacking there for a time. But, you know, we did come up with that overtime win over McKendry, and then we went to another you know, little slump there where we lost, you know, five games in a row before we beat Lewis in the season finale. We had never beaten Lewis in a GLVC game at all, anywhere, when we beat him that afternoon. So, 
you know, you certainly, you know, see right there that, you know, we had our moments this year that, you know, show that we can certainly play with the better teams in the GOVC. And during the regular season, we're the only ones to be the number one and number two seeds in the conference tournament. That's something to hang your hat on right there. And, you know, Lewis came into that game at the end of the year as the number one seed, and we knocked him to the number two by beating him that day. And we'd already beaten SBU, which was the number one seed, as it turned out. So we were the only team during the regular season to knock both of them off. So yeah. you yeah. certainly see what we're capable of right there oh, you know, yeah. on a team basis. Yeah, no, it's, you know, I think we'll, we'll go ahead and pull the pull the stats up here real quick. Um, you know, obviously, Caden, Caden had a monster year this year. Um, I think he had he had all we, we had four double doubles on the men's side this year. He right. had he had all four of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, average eleven points, six and a half rebounds a game for the year. Had forty nine steals. You know that's part, part of why he was named to, to the all defensive squad. Uh, Julian averaged just. Don't forget the seventy two assists he had too. He led the team in assists also. Yeah, that was uh, also a third on the team. If I'm looking, third in blocks. He had twelve blocks. Yeah, he's, he's a guard. Mm-hmm. Um, you know Julian averaged nineteen nineteen a game. Uh, shot thirty, almost thirty nine percent from three this year, uh, almost forty percent from the floor this year. Um, you know, I said Alex Strotting was a great, great get this year. Um, you know, Probably get, the best inside score we've had in a while here. Oh yeah, but you know, I I would agree with that. You know, t- he averaged you know ten a game. Um, you know, he shot sixty one percent from the floor. Yeah, sixty one point four from the floor. Uh, you know, really, really impressive uh, big man, you know, transferring in from Colorado, uh, bringing that D1 prowess and experience here. Uh, Dylan Singleton, you know, kind of kind of started off slow, kind of, you know, figuring out, you know, the speed of the game and everything as a freshman, but he really, really turned it on uh, as we got going, finished up averaging uh, seven and a half points a game. At uh, Maryville game that we ended up uh, dropping by one, he – he had, that was the Dylan Singleton show that day. He right. finished with uh, with 21, played all played all 40 minutes. Um, played a lot of minutes throughout the year. So yeah, especially know, the year going a lot had longer. 39 in that overtime game against Quincy. 35 second time through against Drury. 38 against Lewis. 37 against Southern Indiana. And this is a true freshman we're talking about here too. Yeah. I mean, not not a, not, a, like, not a second you know, year not freshman. A, not a COVID freshman. This is a yeah. true freshman. First here. first year freshman. Yeah. He, he was in the starting lineup. When we went to Bradley for an exhibition game after yeah. our season opener. Yeah, he's he uh, and 20, never, 20, never left the starting lineup. Twenty eight games, twenty seven starts this year. Um, so it was really, you know, really, uh, really good to see him, you know, come out and and do do the things that he was able to do this year. And a guy who I think made a lot of improvement even as the year progressed. I mean, you saw oh, sure. a little bit of the rawness in him early in the year, but as I think he gained more confidence along with time, he certainly became a. Certainly a player I think you can certainly feel very comfortable with over the next three seasons. Oh, absolutely. Shot 47% from the field. Um, talk about Ryan Parker and Micah Johnson. Those two kind of kind of helped, uh, you know, tag team down down on the post at, uh, you know, kind of that four, that four spot. You know, they can both pop out, shoot the three a little bit. Um, Micah actually shot 40% from three this year. Um, shot 470 from the floor this year. Uh, averaged five. Five, almost five and a half and three and a half a game. Uh, Ryan shot uh, about just shy of forty percent from the field. It was thirty-one percent, a little bit, little bit more from three. Thirty-one percent on the, about twice as many shots or twice as many makes as Micah had. Um, Average six, uh, about six and a half and five this season. So uh, you know, those two had had good years. Um, I tell you, who really was was kind of fun to watch. For me this year was uh, was Michael Apaya Brefo, uh, the walk on who kind of you know worked his, worked his way in, started you know started getting some starts, seeing a lot of quality minutes uh, as the season went on. Um, you know, I you know that's that's he. I mean, I was I was remember the Maryville game. He had those two big dunks and everything. Kind um, of an energy guy that you know he probably needed off the bench. Yeah, um, def- definitely somebody fun to watch. You know, whenever he was out there, you kind of had to keep an eye on him because you knew he was going to do do something. You know, come up with a big block or come up with a big rebound. Or... He had 53 rebounds on 164 minutes of action this year. So about one every three minutes he put on the floor. He was out there this year. Yeah. So um, definitely somebody that uh, you know we're glad to have and, and look forward to seeing what he does uh, moving ahead uh, in his career. So, of course, the big thing going, the big thing going forward right now is you're going to have to replace your inside game. You had Alex Trotting, who was a very good offensive player, probably his, his strong point right there. 
Then you have Madame and Nukama Kamara, who's you know certainly a strength on the defensive end of the floor and certainly can't teach seven feet and you know you know long wingspan. Mm-hmm. But he was obviously a force down there, you know, to deal with, you know, on the defensive end of the floor. And we have to replace both of them. So, you know, I know they have one, you know, coming in, you know, in the recruiting class for this coming year, but you know, certainly they'll be looking around to try to find some more help for the inside game too. Sure. You know, that's uh, you know, definitely a good year to to build on. Um, definitely taking a big step forward this season. Uh, keep that momentum going and uh, carry that uh, again into uh, the 22-23 season. God, that's, that feels so weird to say. You know, we just keep rolling rolling right along with all that. Yeah, we're already about halfway through the third month of 2022 already. Where's it going? <laughs> um, staying on the hardwood, we'll switch over talk uh, women's hoops this year. Year two of the Cura Carta era was a good one. Seven win improvement from uh, from last year. Miners finished 11-16 and 16 overall, 8-12 and 12 in the GLVC. Um, that's uh, probably the best season for the women's program in you know, almost the last decade. Yeah, about uh, eight years. Going going back to that 12-13 season uh, when S&T went 16-12, and 10-7. and 7, Yeah, you're uh, about eight or nine years. Since in the had GLVC. Year. Um, several, several highlight real wins for the Miners. Uh, had that record-setting outing against Blackburn in the opener. Uh, scored a program single-game record, 115 points uh, to get the year going. Um also picked up wins. Uh, had had a season sweep over William Jewell. Uh, won on the road against Quincy. Uh, got round two against UND at their place. Uh, knocked off Rockhurst in the return trip here. Uh, beat McKendry. Beat Lindenwood. Uh, knocked off Lewis in overtime to close out the regular season at home. Uh, a couple of all GLVC selections this year. Alex Kerr and Laura Rodriguez. They were third teamers a, a year ago. They were second teamers this year. Um, both of them also eclipsed the 1,000-point mark for their career this season. Uh, Alex did that at the free throw line in that road game against Quincy. Uh, Laura did it in uh, round two against Rockhurst. I think it was her, what, first three of the second half? Yeah. Um, she was trying to get it all in the first half, I think. Yeah. <laughs> she was like uh, 20 points away going into the, yeah. into the game. And had, eight, like and had, and had 18 in the half. Yeah, I remember that because we were just like, oh, my gosh, she's shooting the lights out. Yeah. Um, also saw the uh, the record-setting career of Marta Dirk come to a conclusion. She was back for her fifth season this year uh, that was granted by the NCAA on account of COVID. Um, her name's going to be all over the record books when we get uh, get around to updating those this summer. Uh, you know, and all-time leader in games played and uh, among the top ten and top five in steals, assists, three-point shooting. Uh, so want to want to thank Marta for everything that she she brought uh, to the program and uh, sticking around this year and and helping. Uh, was you know there was kind of a there there was a lot of old old older folks on the team this year with with a lot of younger folks and, and not a whole lot in between, um, but uh, you know there's there's a lot of growth a lot of development over the course of the season uh, with the women's team um, went through some tough stretches here and there but that's just the nature of, of playing basketball um, you know just kind of what are what are some things that stood out to you uh, this season uh, when it came to the women's team? Well, I think. If there was some kind of form for alarm, it may have been early on. Um, of course, we were without Alex Curtis to start the season. She didn't play the first five years. Yeah, of the coming, year coming back off of that injury from, from from last season. Yeah, right. And the second game of the year, after we had the big game against Blackburn, um, we lose to Missouri Southern seventy-four to fifty. And here's a, you know we're playing a Missouri Southern team that was picked to finish ninth in the MIAA. Yeah. I don't think any of us realized at the time how good Missouri Southern ended up being. Yeah. That team ended up winning the MIAA regular season title. It went up in the NCAA tournament this year. So. They try to be a whole lot better, I think, than anybody expected. So if maybe the early alarms were maybe premature at that point in time. You know, we had some. We played three MIAA teams early in the year, and then we played Drury in our first conference game after that. So, you know, we're one and four at that point in time. But then we got Alex Kerr back uh, for the William Jewell game, and everybody on I think things kind of stabilized yeah. a little bit at that point. Now the one plus out of the early part of the year was you saw a lot of Caitlin Roberts the first couple months of the season. Absolutely, and I think. We found you know, a player right there that certainly is going to be a presence for the next you know, three seasons. And, you know, um, now, her numbers did kind of tail off a little bit during the second half of the year, well, but a lot of it was Alex on the floor Alex a lot more. On, out there more. But, yeah, I know talking talking about uh, Caitlin Roberts, uh, standout freshman, had a couple of double-figure games early in the season. Uh, had led the league in block shots. Led the league in block shots. Even with, a, even with a reduced playing time over a, time. Yeah. Uh, finished just outside the uh, top ten all-time in single-season blocks in program history. She had 38 this year in uh, 27 games. Um, 
like I said, led the league in blocks pretty much start to finish. Um, mm-hmm. Beat out a couple of players from uh, Lindenwood who were like two, three. Alex Kerr had 29 uh, when she finally came back, and that was uh, that was also a top five mark. Um, but you're talking about Caitlin, you know, five, five, five point three uh, points, four point one rebounds. Had had 26 assists from yeah. from her center spot. Had really had really good vision. Uh, shot nearly 66 percent from the field. Um, had 11 in that game against Missouri Southern. Had 12 against Pitt State. Uh, back-to-back double-figure games against Jewel and SBU. Had 12 and 10. Uh, had 12 boards. The first matchup of the year with Drury. Um, yeah, again, her numbers kind of tailed off. You know, when we got to January and February. But again, I think that's more of a result of Alex Kirby on the floor a lot more. And there were times that they actually played both Alex and Kayla on the floor together. At times this year, you know, kind of gave them a tool, you know, Twin Towers presence and you know down low and. You know, I think there was some benefit to that. But, you know, of course, you know, that's, again, it's not her fault necessarily. It's just that their numbers, you know, fell off well, because Alex was on the floor more, I think, at that point in time. You put those numbers together with the two of them, then they're very, very impressive that position. Oh, absolutely. Here's one for you. Uh, 27 games played for Caitlin Roberts this year. She scored in all but one of them yeah. this year. Uh, so a really, really good job by by the freshman uh, coming in, helping helping fill that void when Alex was uh, was still working her way back, uh, starting those first five games of the year, and then coming off and and kind of being able to play that you know play a role off the bench, kind of kind of spelling spelling Alex, Kristen Keys, um, you know, and kind of helping give give a different look out there uh, with different rotations and everything throughout the season. Yeah, I think one of the big keys to the success we did have in games is just that we did win versus the games we lost, was that we had anybody scoring beyond Alex Kerr and Laura Rodriguez. If we can get a third player in the mix, at least, then we were a lot more dangerous. It was just basically those two that we really, you know, I think scuff up her points a little bit. But, you know, defensively, I thought we got better as, of course, you know, as the year went on this year. We really, you know, you start looking at those point totals a lot of the games later in the season, and they're down, you know, in the 60s, low 70s, the one exception being the game at Lindenwood. But that's the game we you know, basically shot the lights out up there in St. Charles that night. Kind of got to be able to shoot up, but all those scores down the year, our last five games of the year, the scores the opposing team put up at 65, 63, 69, 67, 60. You know, you're going to win a lot of games, you know, when you're holding teams down that way. So, you know, and we won that Lewis game late in the year, a game that, you know, I think that was, a, you know, one of those games. I think maybe for the first time, you, get, you had a game you felt like you had to win against to to something, and their motivation today was not to go to Chicago. <laughs> You know, because they had – that was the possibility. They have lost that game. Yeah. They're going to go up right back to Lewis to play them again yeah. two days later. Well, ended, ended up playing Illinois Springfield as, played a, them well. as a result of that. Yeah. Defensively, we were very solid in that game up there. We just, you know, we just had a tough time scoring it for the first quarter. Mm-hmm. You know, we only scored 30 points in the last 29 minutes. That's, yeah. you know, hard to win games that way. And, you know, we are just kind of holding them off, holding them off, holding them off as long as we could. But eventually, you know, you got to put the ball in the basket. We just, you know, we're unable to really do it consistently – over the final three quarters of that game. Sure, yeah. You know, going going back and talking talking defense, you know, that's kind of been uh, something I think uh, Coach Carter has really kind of brought brought an emphasis and a, a point of focus to. Had 204 steals as a team this year. That was, uh, you know, among the among the league leaders. 90 block shots as a team this year. Um, you know, obviously you had Caitlin and Alex down low uh, being disruptive. Um, Kristen Keyes had was in a double figures. Had 11 had 11 blocks. Um, when it came to steals, though, too, you know, Marta Dirk, you know, one, one of the best to ever do it, had 49 this year. Keys had 33. Alex had 27. Laura Rodriguez had 22. Uh, four other players in double figures, Michaela Davis, Aaron Pewitt, Chorus Davis, and, uh, and Jada Lynn Smith, you know, really getting after it on the, on the defensive side of the ball. Um, then you talk about scoring. You know, obviously you had Alex and Laura that both averaged, uh, you know, Right around 14 a game, I think. Yeah, Laura was 14-1. Alex was right at 14. Um, when Kristen Keys was on, she was on. Um, had that big, had that big 21-point game against. Uh, it was U Indy. U Indy at home, yeah. Um, had 17 against Lindenwood, 13 against Indy in the return trip, 11 against uh, UIS, uh, 11 first time against SBU, 13 first time against uh, William Jewell this year. Uh, you know, Marta Dirk. Uh, got off to a slow start, uh, kind of found her stroke a little bit late. Didn't quite get to the 1,000-point mark for her career. Finished at, uh, at 995, uh, looking to become the 18th player in program history to do that, but came up just short. Um, 
tell you who was great to have back this year, though, was Michaela Davis. I was getting ready to mention that because, you know, she has been out really for two years. The last time she played, I was still a student here. Right. <laughs> and I think what we found with her this year was she was a player who could bring some offense off the bench. And, you know, she would – Showed she could drive to the basket and at least draw fouls, and you know, or she could finish plays there at times. You know, and a big part of that win at Quincy had 14 off the bench, and she was just one cut and go and laying it yeah. in the whole night, and Quincy couldn't stop her. And I think that's it was good to see her, you know, get back in. I think really the second half of the year when I think she started feeling a lot more comfortable out there on the floor. I think you really started to see the Michaela Davis we saw when she was a freshman, and I think that's you know a good sign, obviously, going forward here, you know, in the next season. I mean, she'll be. She's in that same class with Alex and Laura. You know, great wise, and they're going to come back been, next year. Been, been here for four years, but she's only. This was only her second year playing. Right, and you're going to have the COVID year that's going to allow Laura and Alex to play next year, and both of them are in line right now to break our single seasons, our all-time scoring record. Yeah, uh, both are within 400 points of that mark right now. So you have a chance. And in fact, um, Laura is farther away from it right now. She's 375. Alex is 331 going to next season. Laura scored 381 points this year. So yeah. and Alex did, scored three hundred and eight in five less games. Right. So. so you certainly had to feel that, and Alex right now obviously is closer to that mark. But you certainly feel like both of them have a shot to you know get the Tamara Caskell's record going into next season. Granted, they have the fifth year to do it, but you know I, as I mentioned before, you know we haven't really had many postseason games to play. Where you know if we want to say got to a conference tournament, one or two or three games there, got to a regional, one or a couple of games there, that's basically the equivalent of your COVID year last year. That's about twenty. We played twenty one games in the 19, or 2020 21 season. So basically, that's just add that onto the schedule. Or maybe you've got an exempt tournament early in the year where you pick up a couple games there. Sure, yeah. So you have an opportunity to play about 20 extra games over four years mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. So, I mean, it's not going to diminish the accomplishment necessarily in this case. Oh, uh, plenty plenty to look forward to, plenty to be excited about is, uh, you know, we look to, look to year three of the goal mine with, uh, with women's basketball again. Uh, a great season by both the men's and women's teams this year. Lots of progress made, uh, you know, and we, we look forward to seeing uh, seeing what 2022-2023 uh, has in store for those. Um, I guess now that uh, leaves us with the indoor track and field season. They uh, That got going back in December. December feels like so long ago at this point. Even It feels weird saying it, even though it's only March. Um, that wrapped up over the weekend at the uh, the NCAA Indoor Championships at uh, Pittsburgh State's beautiful indoor facility. Uh, Nathan Swadley, the uh, lone representative for Missouri S and T at the uh, at the national meet, um, had a couple people hit provisional marks, but they weren't quite high enough provisional marks to uh, to advance to the national meet. But but Nate made the most of his opportunity, uh, defended his senior thesis in the morning, and uh, earned All-America honors in the shot put in the afternoon. Uh, set, a, set, set a new school record uh, that he had previously set at the GOVC meet a couple weeks ago, finished sixth, uh, had a really solid effort there. Um, and then throughout the course of the season, had several strong uh, performances. Again, many provisional marks out of both the men's and the women's teams. Uh, just some names of note. Mitch Fairless had another good year uh, on the indoor circuit and in high jump. Uh, Jessica Rhodes, Anne-Marie Tyson, Aaron Jones, and obviously Nathan Swadley, just to name a few. Um, but there was there were some others like Aaron Tobin and um, you know some other, some other folks that really, really did well. Um, you know, just kind of what stood out the most when we're t- when we look back and, and kind of reflect on the indoor season um, or the indoor component of the indoor track and fields or the track and field season. Well, I think I'm going to start on the women's side a little bit here and get into the men's here, but I think number one is like swimming. It was a year in even basketball. It was a year where you kind of had to get back to a normal situation. We were in meets where we were kind of limited, you know, fields and, you know, all the protocols and stuff like that. You had to go through to compete and all that. And, it was kind of nice to get back kind of to a normal situation, you know, meet wise, where you can go where you know, see better competition. You know, was on a there basis. an indoor season last year? They didn't have a championship last year. They had an indoor season, okay. but no championship at the conference level. They didn't have a national meet. Okay. Um, in fact, we kept going to Principia last year for meets last year, you know. But this year, you were able to go to Pittsburgh State, go to Central Missouri, you know, go back to some of those meets. We went to Mizzou, you know, and for meets. And I think, you know, that was really kind of a plus to get, you know, back to a normal situation again. You know, Amory Tyson really, I think, really had a big jump this year in performance. So she got a provisional mark in the high jump this year and um, came very close to our school record. And I think certainly, you know, hopefully that will carry over to the outdoor season for her here. It's going to be starting here you know, pretty soon. 
uh, Jessica Rhodes broke our school record the weight throw. Um, broke that, it by a pretty good margin. That, actually. And that was at the, that was at Principia. At right? the conference meet. Oh, she did. Okay, she did the conference she did, meet. Uh, she broke it at Principia. And broke it again at the conference meet. Okay, so. so. That, so, that just shows that progression throughout the season, you know, getting getting better, getting stronger, being able to, to put forth better efforts. Um, you and know, she I, broke the hammer throw record last year at the conference meet. So, I mean, she's certainly, you know, you know, capable of maybe, you know, making a you know, good run up in the standings here in the GLVC. Didn't quite make top eight this year, but, you know, certainly is an opportunity for, you know, her and others to, you know, certainly, you know, do well. We finished 10th at the conference meet this year, and we did have some, you know, top eight performances, you know, going back to it. Um, but it was certainly – a year, I think, with them, where I think we were kind of able to get back on the beam a little bit, which was, you know, kind of a, obviously a real plus for them. No, and then we go. go. And I do stand corrected, by the way, on um, Jessica. She did finish up, finish fifth in the conference meet, then we could throw. So we had okay. school record throw. I was, I stand corrected on that one. Gotcha, gotcha. But we had also a conference, you know, top eight finish by our relay team this year in the um, this is Bedley relay. So. And we did have some scoring marks this year at the conference meet. It got us to 10th place. Yeah. Um, you know, so pivoting over to the men's side of things, obviously, uh, you know, Mitch Fairless, former basketball player here at S&T, uh, you know, he's turned his attention to track, uh, was the outdoor champion uh, in the high jump last year and uh, continued to uh, kind of terrorize the league in that event uh, over the course of the indoor season this year. Uh, said Aaron Tobin did really well in, in some of the uh, some of the sprint races. Hayes Petitel, uh in some of the distance things this year. Uh, obviously uh, Nathan Swadley in the in some of, in the throwing events, along with uh, who's uh, who was who was it uh, Jacob Lubert as well, um, doing doing really well. So just kind of. You know what? What kind of stood out as far as the performances on the men's side of things during the indoor season? Well, I'll start with the fact we had three all-region performers this year. Um, yeah. Obviously, Swally was one. Mitch Fairless, who unfortunately just missed making nationals, he was probably about a a hundredth of a meter off of making, you know, the national cut. I was say, um, just ma- making a provisional mark, but it's not a high enough provisional mark. Yeah, 209 was his, you know, best jump this year, and he needed like 210 to get in, 211. I mean, it was that, he was that close. I mean, but he, you know, still won conference again, you know, in the indoors. Um, obviously, he was already a well-established pole, uh, high jumper coming out of high school. And we saw that athleticism when he was here playing basketball for us, and he took up track again last spring after the basketball season, won the conference beat, you know, set the conference record in the high jump at our conference meet here at Bulga Bailey Stadium. So, I mean, he's certainly very, you know, obviously you don't have the kind of talent he's got in that event. Um, Aaron Jones. Aaron Jones kind of gets overlooked a little bit here. He went out and, you know, made all region the triple jump this year. And, you know, he had a you know terrific mark of, you know, 47-1.5 at the conference meet, finished third in that event there. So he, you know, had a, obviously a very good year as well. So, you know, then there were others like, you know, you mentioned Hayes Petito. Here's a guy who goes out and sets two individual school records this year. Did in the mile, did in the 3,000 meters. Was also part of a relay team that set a school record as well. He was the anchor on the DMR. So, you know, he, you know, adds that to a couple of the outdoor records he already holds. So he's, you know, certainly, you know, making his mark in, you know, minor track history with what he's accomplished so far. And, he, of course, he's the defending champion in the um, steeplechase that he won last year at the conference meet. So he'll have a chance to defend that title down at SBU in May. So, you have another guy right there that I think that's certainly going to play into it. Joseph Nickel won the conference meet in the in the pole vault. Nick Yankee and Nick Yankee, you know, did very well too at the meet, both in the you know multi events and in the high jump. So, you know, those were guys besides Nathan that you know really had you know really terrific years. I think in the indoor season, and obviously Nathan still work hard. He sees for himself a lot of times. You know, he's a terrific shot putter, and he broke the he won the conference meet indoors. Broke the school record in doing so. He did it by way, he won it by about a half an inch. I mean, Peyton Lewis from Quincy was right on his heels, and Nathan beat him by like a half by like a half an inch. And then the old saying, "Close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades," and in this case, shot put. <laughs> maybe but certainly horseshoes and hand grenades, and some may say nuclear war too. But, um, but you know, then Nathan goes out Saturday and. He came very close to his school record in the second round. And he led the competition after the first flight, which put him into the finals already. 
because I was only at eight in the second flight and nine go to the finals. So, so he was already assured of the spot in the finals. Then in the fourth round, which is the first round of finals, he goes out and throws the school record and pretty much locks himself into the sixth spot. He did pass one person, got passed along the way by one that, you know, fell below him after the first three throws. Um, the first throw by the guy who won it was 19 meters in the very first round. That's that's okay. <laughs> so, and Nathan went 1801, which, you know, obviously broke his record by .16. So certainly a big, big jump there for, you know, him in that event. And obviously that was his highest national finish ever and certainly a terrific way to finish the season. And like you mentioned, he was, you know, doing a student design, you know, thesis that morning in a hotel room. And, you know, finished that, hopped in the car, went out, hopped in the car, van, whatever he took up to Pittsburgh, and went up there, competed, finished sixth. It's a good day all around. Epitomizing what it means to be a student athlete here at Missouri S&T. At the and he's highest. a terrific like, student on top of that, yeah. too. He's an academic All-American, so two-time academic All-American. So he's, you know, certainly, you know, made a very good mark for himself here at the university. Absolutely. Uh, well, John, I think that just about uh, covers everything. You know, we got we took care of uh, indoor track and field. We got basketball. We got swimming, and we don't we don't have too many other indoor things. We don't have hockey or no, or, or any, anything else that goes on during the winter. So I think uh, I think that just about wraps it up. So um, anything else you want to kind of add before we kind of start? You know, we only got like three months left this year before we, you know, finally hit that summer break that uh, I think we're finally all finally all looking forward to. Well, probably closer to two months, maybe two, two and a half months, depending on if we get anybody to track nationals or not. Yeah. Um, but certainly, you know, the spring seasons are off to a promising start. I mean, we've, you know, baseball sit at 7-6 right now, and, you know, I think we've seen some progress over the last, you know, couple of weeks. You know, we got a four-game sweep for Southwest Baptist over the weekend, which was good for them. They really kind of needed that after, you know, kind of a tough stretch there against Drury and, a tough loss to Maryville last week in extra innings. Yeah, softball. Yeah, softball's up to 10-10 10 10 start. You know, they've you know, already exceeded their win total from last season. And I think we're starting to see, you know, some progress on that front as well. And I think it's certainly a very, you know, good spring coming up here for them. And, of course, you know, our men's track team is defending conference champions. And, you know, we're looking to defend that title in May when we go down to SBU to compete in the conference meet. And we got golf back going, And golf too. back in the Carl, mix again. So Carl and Colin and, and – had a good first beat, yeah. you know, score wise. I mean, the competition was terrific down in Las oh, Vegas. Yeah. It was, you know, it's eleven top fifty teams in a field of nineteen, so they really kind of got to see where they stack up against some of the some of the best competition in the country uh, out at their first event. But uh, obviously, Carl did uh, did some big things at the at the conference meet last year, and I know we had we had Colin on a couple weeks ago, and uh, you know, I, I think the, all the boys on the golf team are, are looking forward to to kind of showing out this spring and building off of. Uh, you know, the success they've had previously and, and keeping that going through this season. And so they have a goal in mind to get back into the match play again, which they did a year ago. So certainly, you know, obviously you're going to you know, face good competition. That's how you get better. And they went out to Vegas and, you know, competed that meet. Score-wise, they, you know, actually put some good scores up out there. It's just, you know, it's the level of competition they're going up against is where well, we kind of finished where we did in the standings, but there's no reflection on how we played out there. So... Well, John, I know uh, I know we're both kind of busy, you know, not as busy as we've been, but I know we're both busy with everything. So uh, appreciate you, you know, hopping on this one and, and kind of helping us walk through uh, the winter sports season. I know it would kind of get boring if I was just talking to myself for yeah. 40 minutes. Um, I don't think anybody would really want to listen to that. So um, just be sure to patronize our sponsors. Here, I know you're going to get to here in a second. Yeah, yeah. So, but no, that'll do it for this episode of Inside the Mind. Again, presented by Missouri S and T Dining Services. Again, want to thank them for everything they do for minor athletics and for Missouri S and T. If you aren't already, please take a moment. Be sure to subscribe to this show wherever you may be watching or listening. That way, you don't miss an episode. If you have missed any previous episodes, you can go to minorathletics.com under the Fan Zone tab. You look for the Inside the Mind podcast. There's links to uh, all previous videos on that page, along with all the platforms where the show is available on YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Deezer, and TuneIn. Again, thank you all so much for watching. You helped make this show possible. We appreciate your support. We look forward to chatting with you again soon. And as always, cheers and go Miners. Thank you.